with us today. And we want to chat a little bit about uh, in CatCam and some of the uh, questions what I had for him when, when we met in Chicago and okay. which were very great for me to see the answers to. The, he pulled up some studies. So we will have a recording here. I, I know um, if you're just tuning in, listening in, being on your phone and you're driving, I, I heard um, you can maybe later uh, look at the recording if you want and then see the studies as well, et cetera. But I was basically under the impression that uh, in CATCAM, uh, I knew it was being done for a long time in Brazil, but I thought it was yeah. single units mainly and not uh, technically all the full-out cases. And um, I was curious about the, the research and the long-term stability of, of things, um, since there is no metal part involved now, um, if there's any wear, et cetera, um, if the passivity of the fit can be accomplished, all those questions. And um, I didn't realize that that there was already years and years what that has been done. Um, and that was that was awesome. And the studies what you pulled up were fantastic. And maybe we can dive in a little bit into into that. Um, but maybe not everybody knows what in CATCAM is. So maybe if you want to do a quick intro or something, that would be amazing. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity, Richard. Thanks, Holly. Um, so just uh, letting you guys know a little bit of uh, the background uh, behind Incadcam. So we are a Brazilian-based company. So we were born here in Brazil, developed between here and Austria, actually. So back in 2013, 14, um, here in Brazil, it's really common uh, to use, uh, before the whole digital era, it, it was really common to use the the, the the castable wax components oh, okay. right, that U fits direct to UCLA's. That's it. Yep. That's it. We call it UCLA in in yep. Portuguese, but it's it's basically UCLA's. Yep. So the idea is that uh, you were casting components that fit directly to implants. Okay. So that was the main the main idea behind it. So when we came to digital, uh, if you take the strategy, the standard strategy that uh, Amon Gearbox milling machines have. As they use only round top burrs, mm -hmm. you really don't get quite the good result for those connections. So the Inked Kim is a strategy that activates flat burrs to allow you to mill those types of connections. Like so, so if we were to summarize the whole thing, that's basically what it is. And uh, this was developed in partnership between a distributor here in Brazil and the R&D team back in Austria for, from Amman Gearbook, right? So this was a joint venture, the development. So in the future, back in 2015 or 16, it became two different companies. So that's when Incadcam becomes a different company from Amman Gearbook, right? So it yeah. takes this strategy and it starts selling it separately, okay? So again, the idea behind it is uh, if we think on a lab, if we think on a clinic is to allow you to give you the flexibility to work without using those tie bases, right? So if you want to do a screw retained case, like Richard was talking about, so um, let's say a full arch and all on four case, all on six case, whatever. Yep. And uh, you don't want to use tie bases, right? Which some of you guys know that uh, you might have some issues on the cementing part. It's, it's quite tricky there. The, the ceramics applications are not there yet. So if you want to go for, if you want to go for full zirconia using, for example, a solid Gen X, which is a great product, uh, you can do that using Inked Cam, right? So that's the main point behind it. And uh, Richard, let me know what, how, how do you want me to, to talk about the studies a little bit? How do you want me to, to, dive deep into this. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so to maybe just add and, and, and throw out, um, I, I was one of them, of course, who had to instantly try and see if I can mill somehow yeah. <laughs> and, uh, on geometry. And I, I can attest, it doesn't, it doesn't work. I mean, no, all of that was just based on, on a model and an, and an analog just to see what it does. And, and you could clearly see even without a microscope, but especially on a microscope, that's, you would never consider placing that. I, at least I would hope. <laughs> I would hope. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it just doesn't work. You need you need a a, a, a flat tool tip for sure, a, a bull nose or whatever it is called, um, and and a special uh, strategy for that in order to make that happen, right? <clears throat> and I um, 
I, I basically knew that in Brazil, the Cintron is huge. So uh, I knew about all the, uh, and technically the Cintron is very big um, everywhere in the world besides in the US. Yeah, yeah, that's, I find it weird that it's not uh, big in the US, but okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, basically it's a chrome cobalt, which is Cintron like Zirconia, right? And then uh, the quality of the chrome cobalt is outstanding and the, uh, it's easy to be milled, very little tool wear. And if you can look past the fact that you have to center it, and if everything goes goes okay with your shielding, gas, and then components, it's really a great looking product and and a, and a fantastic quality of it. Um, and I can totally understand why there have been so many single units being made. But what I didn't know is is the full out cases, like I said in the beginning. And the, the big questions for me were basically, well, what's with the what's with the surface of the zirconia? Um, is the mill being able to replicate uh, a, a clean enough surface quality with that strategy? Because I mean, I, I know what roughly the surface strategy looks like uh, on the crown, but I, I mean, I, I get it. It's, it's a milling strategy would come in, into play there. And if we're looking at how clean and nice a margin can be milled, and then the same is basically applied to, to that, I'm sure there can be a good surface, I, but I, how do you know if you've never seen it, right? Um, so I had that question in my mind about the surface and if there might be any uh, abrasion in between the parts or something. Um, and the other one was about pass, uh, passivity. So basically when your, your mill is milling in a, in a certain tolerance um, and I feel like any kind of error or even the sinterization and when something is done wrong with the stabilizer placement, how many connectors are on there and whatever. And there is a little bit of warpage. I feel like the cement could potentially help to compensate for those kind of errors. So <clears throat> I wasn't sure how applicable it really is until you told me, well, we're doing it since 10 years or something like that is what you said, right? Yeah, yeah. So if we take a look into, um, we don't have, let's say, clinical studies that uh, that take those 10 years into account but what we can say is that on the support side that we get here like complaints and tickets and support stuff that we have here uh we i'm not gonna say zero but it's probably close to zero from all those years that we we, we never received a, a complaint about a case that was already on the patient's mouth that it ended up breaking because of in cad cam usually it's um it's something alongside the usage of Inkit Cam. For example, the, the main issue that uh, usually, one of the main concern is that, is the zirconia gonna handle the torque of the screw, right? That's yeah. one of the main concerns there. Yes. Of course, it depends on the type of zirconia you're using. You cannot use, for example, a uh, FX multi-layer if yep. you're doing big structure. You have to go for more, um, how, how do I say that? For more solid ones, for more uh, structural uh, ones. St st stronger, more, more dense, uh, higher megapascal. Yep. Yeah, higher megapascal. Uh, what we have as a baseline, as a, good, uh, as a good practice from what we see around the world is go at least with a Gen X. So Gen X or higher. So we're talking about here on the on Amon Gearbox side, that, uh, that's where I, I can talk a little bit about. Um, either the Zolid Gen X, Zolid HT, the whole line, and Zolid ZI, of course. ZI would be the most, uh, the, the strongest one of them all, right? And uh, one thing that's really cool is that uh, there were some studies uh, conducted because uh, regarding the wear that the component does on the implant, right? Because that's uh, that was one of the big concerns. So yes. you're having two different materials, maybe has uh, galvanization, is that it? I know in Portuguese, I don't know if that's a, no, that's a word in English. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, so if you have uh, two different types of materials, uh, if that's going to cause any type, any sort of damage on the, on the implant, right? So if, if it, if it's uh, threatens to lose the implant and uh, what this study found out, so basically how the study was conducted, right? So they milled a lot of different um, components. So they milled one component done in zirconia, one done in hard cobalt chrome, one done in cintron, one done in wax, and one in titanium, right? So they got all of those installed on the analogs, 
and then simulated 1 million bytes, right? Under a saline environment to simulate the, the mouth environment, right? And then they analyze the implant where before and after this mechanical cycle. And what they found out is that there is no significant differences between the titanium, zirconia, cintron, and the hard cobalt chrome disc. The only one that showed a little bit of a difference there was the selective laser melted because it has a rougher surface yeah. because it's selective, say, because it's a, it's a different, uh, it's a different method of fabrication there. So it generates rougher surfaces. So that's why it, uh, it damages more the implant connection. Yep. Yep. Makes, makes total sense. Yep. Um, surface, uh, we, we already know that from, from the, the, the teeth that we're making in zirconia that they need to be polished ideally you know, so that they're not <clears throat> destructive to the opposing. So it's the same concept there, I, I would assume. Um, and thanks for <clears throat> bringing that up with the screws. And the screw seat, if it can withstand the torque, because we spoke about that in, in, in Chicago as well. Uh, I mean, of, of course, you need a different type of screw than if you want to skip the, uh, um, the titanium sleeve altogether on a, on a pole, let's say, screw retained. Um, but uh, I wasn't sure, like, what is, what is the science behind that? Is, is that okay? Like, what happens if somebody over talks it? What happened? Like, um, what is, if it's now not perfectly passive, wouldn't, am I not uh, putting some sort of tension on it? And then over time and eventually who knows how long uh, it might fracture. But I was amazing to hear that you said, nope, uh, our experience is not that. And okay. if you've been doing that for so many years, that is, that's fantastic news. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we ran a survey, Richard, with, uh, with our customers. Right? So we basically tried to figure out, because we, we had never done that before up until last year, okay, to 2021. We haven't really tried to communicate with our customers to get a really understanding of how they were using the solution. Yeah. And uh, meaning, uh, are they using more for metals? Are they using more for bridges? Are they using more for single units? What's, what's the type of work that they are doing? Yep. And uh, the results that we that came to us were really amazing. So basically, what we found out is that around sixty percent are doing either for multi-unit bridges mm -hmm. or bars, right? So, um, or for example, all on access case, they kind of fit on the on that category there. Mm -hmm. And forty percent were doing single crowns, single units. Okay, and half of them were doing metal meaning either Cintron or wax. Mm -hmm. And the other half was doing in zirconia. So this is, uh, this is a survey that we ran around the world, right? So we didn't focus specifically in Brazil or specifically in Europe. So as we have, uh, as we have users all around the world, we try to get like a global view. And uh, we also asked, okay, so do you guys have any type of issues? Like, well, do you, have you ever broken an implant? Have you ever, I don't know, uh, lost a bridge, lost a bar, lost a crown due to, due to the usage of Inked Chem? Yep. And uh, what we got from around 40,000 units milled, meaning 40,000, let's, let's think about 40 unit connections, right? It can be on a, on a all on four, there would be four units, just so we, we're clear here, right? From all of those 40,000, only 115, 100, and between 115 and 120 showed some sort of issues. So if we do the math there, that's 0.32% of complaint rate, which is really low compared to, just think about that. We're talking about customers for all, all around the world. Yeah. And uh, the problem that they complained about were not implant lost, were not uh, health issues to the patients, were not uh, crown lost. The issue that they mentioned the most was the screw loosening after a while, which we know can depend not only on the material, it can depend also on the torque that is put in on the beginning, right? So that's the main, that's the main uh, complaint that they have, which is something easy to manage. Right, it's something easy. If we have good practice there, it's something easy to manage. But uh, one thing that I always like to make it really clear 
we are talking about like really precise connections. So we are talking about fine engineering. So yeah, of course you have to have original material on your milling machine. You have to have a good calibration. You have to have a good mill. You have to have good material, good zirconia. So you have to have all this parameter set to get a good result. I think that's, the, that's one of the main points here. So you, you cannot get like a really cheap zirconia with really cheap uh, burr, try to mill it and expect that it's going to get the result as you do in, with all original stuff. I think that that's kind of a given, but uh, the right. obvious must be said sometimes. Right. Um, what is, if, if you remember, since you guys made a survey and, and then I learned more about the usage and, and the materials for people are, um, applying them, um, do, do you remember do you have a couple of people using peak yeah yeah we do that's not a lot still not a lot not a lot what i think personally is that they don't use because peak takes too long to mill so if we're thinking about let's say if you're going to mill a full protocol here that you're going to use this structure i think i have a picture i mean can i share my screen with you guys uh, I, I think the host has to allow me to share but uh as we, as you guys allow me to share, uh, if you think about a full structure in uh, in peak, it's gonna take around I don't know seven eight hours to mill. Is it that long? Yeah, if you if you I'm do gonna, a big, I'm gonna give you the the host rights for now because I don't I don't see an other way of doing that. So you're you're the host right now, so you should be able to share. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> uh, yeah. Let me share here. So what I'm talking about are cases like this guy here. Yes, exactly. And what I love about the thought of, of, of that is um, repairability is, is fairly straightforward because if something breaks, um, hopefully only a single crown breaks and then you're facing that. Your framework ideally shouldn't break if it's if it's designed uh, thick enough and well enough, etc. Uh, exactly. And you're eliminating the issues of warpage during sinterization with the whole thing, where that could yeah, you take one a, variable off the whole yeah, thing. It could be it could be having a huge impact on on a passive fit if if something goes wrong in your sinterization, and and I mean we all know how how fast that can happen. With just a couple of screws um, placed wrong or something, and uh, who knows? Um, I I like this. The only the only thing then, of course, uh, well, it takes long. It's it's a tedious process, and and you're ending up um, maybe having to um, deal with with like if you don't seal around the CEJ of the tooth, maybe you can see some discolorations or something. Who knows over time? Yeah. yeah. Um, one other, if we think, and, then, and now Richard, I think we have to think a little bit on the on the lab side, on the clinical yeah. side, right? On the on the let's say on the on the day to day. I think that's yeah. good. Uh, that's a good view that we can think. Uh, one thing that peak is more expensive, right? It's a good material, yes. It's a, it's awesome, but it's expensive, and I don't know. I can say about the cost here in Brazil. And I don't know if in the US it's it's like that, but if we take, for example, a 18 millimeter blank from uh, of peak and compare it to Cintron, mm -hmm. Cintron is around 15% cheaper. Yes. And Zirconia is kind of around there also. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't know in the US, do you know if that's uh, that's about it? I, I guess I guess it depends, and it depends on how how many fillers you have in the material usually. But if you if you're getting a, a very um, um, clean peak, how how I would say with not a lot of uh, glass fiber fillers or whatever they're putting in there, mm -hmm. um, then then I would I would say you're about three hundred and fifty bucks in four puck. Yes. Yeah, and uh, besides that, I don't know. And then you still need. Uh, Sarconia or Emacs and all to make the teeth on top. Yes, exactly. exactly, exactly. So you have to put on top of that. And also you have the the whole machine cost that you have to put in into account. So let's say you're going to put uh, the burrs, they wear more 
on peak than they do in Sintra and then and then they do in in Circonia, for example. Um, I don't know if I if I guess here, I think you can do maybe around 150, 180 crowns in Circonia. If you think in peak, I don't think you can do a hundred because the material is hard and, and the birds are the same, right? Um, yeah, absolutely, totally. Yeah, and so that's what longer process yeah. overall uh, because you're yeah. ending up having to um, uh, put some composite on it, etc. And yeah. yeah, I mean, on the technical side, it's amazing, no doubt. Yeah. But on the business side, it might be a little trickier. So I'd say this is for more like high end, high end side. So that's a high end solution. We yeah. we have to think of a of the whole thing, not only not only on the technical side, but also on the business side. I think that's a good uh, always a good approach that we can have. Totally. Totally. Okay. Um, so um, if you don't mind, let me go ahead and uh, let me share with you guys just some cases because I think it's uh, it's cool that we get uh, that we get an understanding. So what we are talking about here, so I think it's a good idea to kind of get a, a glimpse of what's possible. I'm not going to really go deep into the cases. I just want to show a little bit of the flexibility you can get. So the idea is to allow any Amon Gearbuck milling machine to mill cases like this. So this is, uh, this is not multi-unit, but this is direct to, to the abutment, right? Screw retained no tie bases, no metal free structure, let's call it like this, right? And uh, this is done in Gen X and I think you guys can kind of see it here is uh, reduced for to later do the layering, right? Yep. Um, also another type of case is this guy, which is an all on one, two, three, four, five, six, and all on six direct to MUA using Zolid HT plus here, right? Um, same idea again. I think you guys get what I'm what I'm trying to say. And uh, as we talked a little bit about Sintra, let me just go ahead and show some of the cases. So this bar here, and uh, where Inked Cam really makes difference is on these connections here. So this, if you try to mill a connection like this without using the strategy and the flat burst, you're gonna you're gonna have like round corners, and the adaptation is not there, right? Um, this is the same the same bar, just so you guys see the fitting here, the adaptation, right? And you can see that this is straight out of a straight out of a, the century oven, a little polish, and then install. Um, let me show you the difference. I think this is what you were talking about, Richard, about milling and seeing the difference of a connection. Yes, right? yes, exactly. So if you try to if you get uh, any AG milling machine today without the strategy and try to mill a hex connection, this is what you're gonna get. So you get all this round kind of. It looks more like a flower than a hex. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the difference when you get the the flat burst and the strategy. So that's the that's the whole point. That's what we'll, where we where we really make a difference. What I what I really like about this whole thing is um, uh, that. It was developed together with AG, so that it's not like, you know, it's a partnership and they, they, the R&D made the strategies and everything and it's using like, it's all official. I, I love that about that. It's not just a, as cool as it is. Um, I, I think the way how you guys did it is, is, is couldn't, couldn't have been any better because it's Thank like, you. Um, I don't know how I should, how I, how I should put that. It's like, uh, in, in, instead of going to another tuner, it's like a, a tuner which is, um, I, I don't know, like a, a Maybach of the Mercedes or whatever, you know what I want to say? Like, it's, you're just not bringing it anywhere or somewhere. It's it's a It's all inside the, the, the Amman Gearbuck environment. I yes. think that's the, that's the main point, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's really cool because, uh, I mean, we do... We do have this strong partnership with Amon Gearbuck. We've been having for the past uh, eight years or whatever. And uh, yeah, everything we do, uh, we kind of go through the whole AG process before we get it. So all the activations we go through there, all the libraries that we do, we develop, we test them, then then we deploy it. So it's not, uh, uh, we always like to say we're not a, a garage business. So we're, we're there, we're official, we're with them. 
Um, sorry, I'm a little distracted. I'm I'm having the boys here, and like, one, it's, I know. Yeah, it's no, no problem. Uh, we have a question <laughs> well, here. So, us. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here. So, why isn't Cintron popular in the U.S.? That's a great that's, question. That's a great question. Um, I I can answer it if you if you don't mind. Maybe you have well, go for it. I mean, you have more experience in the U.S. market than I do. I've only been there for a week. Maybe there's something uh, um, you, you, you can add from, from a bird's eye perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, but my experience here is that in the beginning, when, when uh, everything was new, everybody wanted to try it because everybody understood, hey, this is awesome. This, this could be something new. This is exciting. Um, but there were, in the beginning, unfortunately, a couple of, um, of technical um, difficulties in the, in the system. The, the first generation furnace was maybe not the as ideal as, as what it's now and as sophisticated because chambering was very small. Um, the argon gas was ha having a big impact. And I know that was something in Brazil as well, where, where you had yeah. some samples sent in, et cetera, to Amon Kemal had them looked at. But here, you, you guys at least, um, talking about the, the Brazilians making samples and sending that to Amman Gebach to validate that the quality of the organ, what is available there was okay and good enough because the grade couldn't be purchased from what I'm aware of. Uh, it's a proper way of doing it. Here, everybody went the other route or not everybody, a lot of people went the other route. We told them, please use 4.6 medical grade and uh, you can either get 4.5 or uh, 4.8 is the medical. So they, they just went with 4.5 industrial not knowing mm. that what here is medical is validated after the bottle is filled. So they take the sample from the bottle and mm. the industrial grade, they only tell you what they're filling into the bottle. So we had several people which actually then said, oh yeah, it worked totally fine until they got a bad bottle where some residual gas from something else was in there. Who knows what, they had a wet gas. We, things clumped up and whatever. So it, it gotten a, a reputation of, of being too technical and not working out very well. And I, I feel like um, it's unfortunate because if, if, I mean, I've used it in a, in a training center in Charlotte. Um, I, I've used it quite a bit and I, I like it. I think it's easy to use. The only thing I feel like um, as, a, as a wish, I, I, so I, feel, I sometimes feel like it's a little bit too soft. Um, Almost, which is great for malleability, but not when you're like finishing the sprues, et cetera, on it. You have to really be a little cautious with it. Um, but uh, other than that, it's an awesome product. Well, and then the customer had some issues when they didn't uh, stick to the maintenance protocol um, of the Crucible. And then, I don't know, you probably have heard of a couple of cases. The Crucible ended up fusing together. Um, yeah, I remember yeah. uh, one was sent in to us where they asked us, can, can we break it open? Because it actually has a rush case in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we, we couldn't, we, we couldn't uh, open it. Um, those were the, the type of issues where I feel like um, a couple of shortcuts were maybe made and, and ultimately be the reason for the bad reputation, what it has. Yeah. I think one of steps, it, is, is, it is working uh, decent. Mm -hmm. From, from what I see is that um, when we think about, because uh, we, we kind of get like markets in a lot of different levels as we attend the, the global, right? So whenever we see a market that is just beginning with Cintron, they usually run through the same issues. Like the learning curve, it's almost exactly the same everywhere we look around. So where Cintron is really strong, like in uh, Europe, it's basically Europe here in Brazil, and a couple of other countries, but mainly Italy, Germany, uh, Italy, Germany, Brazil. And I think that's it, like the three, three really strong countries there. But uh, whenever we go to new countries, it's always uh, argon supply chain. So they, they, they are not able to get the argon that they need. Yeah. And okay, so once they have that figured out, they have to figure out how to design the case yeah. properly how to design a stabilizer properly how do you put the the how do you do the pins so the the structure yeah. is all aligned so it's it's a learning curve so what i think here in brazil one of the main reasons that it really worked is that um, the distributor also owned the lab here mm -hmm. and uh, he really wanted to make it work because yeah. uh, it, it would be like a really good promotion 
for his lab to have the to have Sintram. So he really put effort and money into it. And then it, it ended up paying out, of course, paying off, paying out, paying off. I don't know. Paying off, yeah. Paying off, yeah. So yeah, I think that's a, the, it, it is a, a learning curve. Uh, but once you have it ready, I mean, uh, this lab here, it, it does more than 3,000 uh, crowns a month. And uh, we don't do anything metal that's not Sintron. So 100% of our metal is Sintron today. Yeah. So we're doing at least 2,000 2, units in Sintron a month. And we don't run into problems with argon, with Sintron, this kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, I, and technically, I, from what I'm understanding, the 4.5 grade wouldn't be an issue either. I think in, in Brazil, it's even lower what, what is available. Um, but it's it's the purity of the gas, I guess. It's the purity. So, definitely the purity. Yeah. And, and with the industrial, yeah, because it just couldn't be taken care of. Um, mm -hmm. And then eventually, you know, leaks and, and when the argon was connected and you, know, you probably didn't know of all those issues. So there's how yeah, we, we ran through, through, through yeah. a lot of those. But the, yeah, at, at the end of the day, yeah, it takes it takes a little bit of effort to get it going. And that's not only on the user side. Yeah. Usually the distributor and the local Amon Gearbox team, they have to be willing to put it, put in, yes. put on the effort to make it work but but once it's working exactly. it's a really amazing option once it's really, working really, every, everybody likes it yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. and and no no degassing etc and that, that was actually that that was one thing as well um where i i know people were trying again because everyone reading through the manual the manual says that the gassing is is optional and people were trying to degas it and basically making it worse yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, um, yeah and yeah I, I don't know. I, I like the, the Sintron. And, and I think um, you might even have a, a picture there where you scrolled over uh, earlier where there's a Sintron um, Mua bar uh, from Nandas, I believe, right? And, and then uh, yeah. Onia's um, tertiary Let structure. Let me share here again. This guy. Yes. Yes. And, and that's just, I mean, that's beautiful. I'm sorry. And that's that's awesome. Yeah, so you have this, and then uh, the zirconia, let's call it superstructure on top. Yeah. And you cement them, and you see the, exactly. the quality here and the aesthetics at the end. Exactly. So yeah, this, uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good option. It's a, it's a really good metal option. If you think on the milling side, again, if we're talking about financially, so uh, if you compare the cost of uh, one unit milled in Sintron with one tie base, I think one one unit in Sintron goes for 15, 16 US dollars, roughly. How much does a tie base cost? 40, 45? Yep. So if you do the math there, it's pretty straightforward. And it's really easy to mill. The, the wear of the tool in Sintron is the same as in wax. Yeah. So it's really soft material. Right. Right. Yeah, this is uh, this is definitely a nice look in restoration. And if, if you can now do that all in house and, and okay, yes, you need a two center services, but theoretically uh, both of them could center at the same time, the Sopronia and your Sintron, and yeah, I like it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I like it. Um, do we have any any other questions so far? We only had that one, right? The Sintron isn't popular in the US, but uh, I know we have a, a few guests on here. And uh, sorry for not instantly saying hello for, for you guys joining. Thanks for being on here. Yeah. But if you have a question, you can unmute yourself if you want, or you can type something in the, in the chat window if you prefer. Um, or if, if it's even something um, for the next time, for next Friday. Exactly. If you want us to bring something else, some different type of cases, some different types of materials, that's something that we can always bring to the table as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. And then <clears throat> I know we, we're basically, we're about a half an hour. Um, we, we changed uh, from the, the first one we did was an hour long and we, we changed to about 30 minutes. And I don't want to hog all your time. I, I'd rather at some point repeat that uh, maybe with you and get you at some point on where we, where we have actually, um, you know, maybe letting people know exactly who you are and why you're on here. Um, 
but uh, um, maybe if I was about to say, if there is not another question coming in, I would, maybe you could uh, talk about the scan body option because I think that is cool. Uh, but here is a question. Why would the purchase of AG mill over a different brands? Um, that is, uh, I would say quality build quality it depends what kind of machine the what you get for the money what you're spending uh, is is very decent with the Amanga Bach mills um, I legit like them and I have repaired them <laughs> for many years now uh, trained them repaired them serviced them um, so I know what can go wrong with them and uh, my other co-workers what I used to to work with repairing them would agree and they uh, one of them worked for cable for a long time before he joined Amon Gerbach. So he has had some exposure for other machines. Uh, other folks worked for um, CAP or, or ZAN. So they had some exposure to the Roland machines, etc. cetera. Um, and sometimes the approach is a little bit different. Yeah? So where, where maybe um, um, some others let you replace your own spindle or whatever you, you might uh, with the Amon Gerbach machines maybe uh, get the message, hey, we would rather have a technician do that. You shouldn't touch it. But that's that's really making that, that decision easier for you that you're not, I don't know, cutting your finger off or <laughs> screwing something up, which makes it worse. Um, and, and the spindle replacements, uh, they, they're usually uncommon compared to on the road. And you, you basically get uh, another spindle right off the bat if you're buying it because they already know it's going to die. Um, uh, on on my side, what I, what I can say is that I, I really don't like the comparison. Like, mm -hmm. uh, can you compare? Why would you purchase a BMW over a Mercedes? Why would you purchase a Ford over a GMC? Each That's machine has its own it's quality, different. but uh, but one thing that I can say is definitely different from uh, any other uh, brands. And this I can say here from, from the experience we have here in Brazil, I don't know if that's the same in the US, probably is, because it's the it's a global politic uh, policy of AG is the support side. So um, what we see here is that, uh, for example, when you get a Zircos on here in Brazil or a VHF, the support side, it's really bad. So it's, it takes too long to get a hold of anyone. It takes too long to get parts and stuff. But uh, but once but when you compare it to AG, it's it's a completely different game. So that's on the machine side. Yeah, there's quality, there's speed, there's reliability. And it's German company. There's a lot of stuff that we can say. But when we think about uh, on the service side, I think that's where it really makes a difference. It's definitely a good company. Um, it, it really depends, like I was saying, what you're comparing to. If you're comparing apples to oranges, and I mean, and there's, there's don't get me wrong, there's some, some kick-ass machines out there from, from some other manufacturers, which are not on Gerbach, but they might then cost you an arm and leg. <laughs> um, and it, that's what I'm saying. You need to see like what, what your money buys you, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. I hope right. that answered it. Cool. Well, I don't know. Uh, let's see. I'm going to hang out here for a little bit, for a couple of minutes. And so if you, if you want to stick around for a couple of minutes, awesome. But that basically, that, that, was, that was awesome. I answered all the questions I had. If you, if you want uh, and share your screen maybe one more time and pull that study up what you had, I think we have it all. Yeah, um, let me do that. Let me go ahead and share here. I think the studies are here. So I think I left it right where it's supposed to go. So just so we, we, we do a walk back a little bit on how the study worked. Different methods of fabrications and different materials, all right? Evaluated before and after 1 million bytes. That's basically how the study was conducted, okay? So ZO here is zirconia, SLM is selective laser melting, MM is hard cobalt chrome milled at Neodent's, um, Neodent's milling center here in Brazil. So like huge milling machines, the one that mills the implants. Um, AM is a Gerbach milling machine with Sermil Sintron. TI is the, the control, the reference, the original components from, let's say, if we're talking about uh, Neodent uh, 
hacks. So this is a, an abutment from near that, okay? So <clears throat> we can see here the where in pixels. So let me just show you guys this picture here. So they evaluated the green area here. So they took a microscopic picture and then they evaluated how much wear in pixels there were on this picture. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the results I, we I, get- I like how they did that. Yeah. So the results they got here, so let's take the, the reference for example. So 1.1 times 10 or five, whatever. So let's just take the 1.1. So 1.1 in titanium, 1.1 in Cintron, 1.1 in zirconia. That's really awesome to see is that with that, you kind of understand that, okay, there's no significant damage on the implant caused by different materials. I think that's really, really interesting to, to hear, to know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and another thing that's really good to understand is the fracture strength. So after the, they did all of that, they compressed the abutments up until failure, right? So up until it cracks or up until it bends. Mm -hmm. So zirconia got 1,005 newtons, SLM 1,074, 1,000, uh, 1,020, 923. Again, basically there is no significant difference between those materials. And that's really cool to, to see from the study, right? The difference here is, of course, well, the failure method, meaning how does the zirconia fails? It cracks, right? And how does Cintron and titanium fail? It bends. That's the main difference there. So when you have zirconia and you fracture it, it's going to crack. When you have Cintron, it's going to bend. And then later on, it's going to crack, right? Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. And to me, it's always seen as believing, you know, you can, if, if one person tells you something, they, they can tell you three times. If you, if you see the numbers, if you see a study was actually conducted, it's, I mean, that, that is, yeah, seen as yeah. believing. <clears throat> so and, uh, it was on purchased up. on the Journal of Prosthetic Dentists. And uh, this guy, the Roberto Marcarian is a guy that uh, he's uh, constantly doing those types of studies. So he's done, he's done in the past one comparing the adaptation. He's done, uh, this was uh, launched, I think, last year, beginning of last year. So he's doing that. I know he's working on something new. I don't know what yet, but I know he's working on something. Awesome. All right. Very cool. Well, Enzo, thank you very much. It looks like there's so far no other questions. So I think um, we... We're totally golden here. I, I um, really love for you taking the time, coming on here, explaining all that. Um, love to, uh, at some point, uh, repeat that. Maybe we're looking at uh, some more specific questions from, from some folks which are coming in. Um, um, but that was, that was really great from you doing an overview for us and showing us all the detail about the studies and the, the stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. and. Uh... I guess thank, thank for Opulent as general for the past, I don't know, two months. I don't know how long we've been working together, but it seems like a lot. And so yeah, yeah. I, I feel like part of the team there. So thank you for the, <laughs> for the, the opportunity. Yeah, we appreciate you, Enzo. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. That was a good conversation. All right. I learned a lot. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, we appreciate it. All righty. Well, then, then yeah. I guess um, everybody has a great weekend. Yeah. All right. And don't work too much. <laughs> yeah, don't work, yeah too much. don't work too much. You need something to do on Monday. So if you, if you take everything in, during the weekend, you, you don't have anything to do on Monday. I can't, I can't believe other than, than Oscar running in here, he, he didn't even say a word. Like he, he just smiled. Every I mean, I was waiting for him it, to but... participate on it. I yeah, was yeah. too. <laughs> uh, you're good. <laughs> all right all right well, thank you guys so cool. thank you guys thanks. thanks for the opportunity and maybe see you next week yeah Sounds definitely good. we'd love that absolutely thanks right. bye-bye right. thank you bye-bye